of In at the Side. I'm Dom Harvin. I'm joined by JK and Sonara Nil. And the man who does this. We're joined by on-screen star and rugby star Danny Lingari. How are you tonight, Danny? Very well, thank you. Considering what we've all got to put up with, yeah, good. Good. What you've been? Uh, what you've been filling your time with then? What's been keeping you busy? Um, trying to make sure that the charity that we set up two years ago um, is still a, keeps afloat during these times, and uh, lots of writing for uh, certain TV series and uh, show. Excellent. Are there any Perfect. positions or, or roles for any, like, you know, shaved head rugby players with, like, beards? Oh, yes, sir. Not, not for a face like yours, Neil. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, many, I was uh... say that, that, That's yeah, why yeah. you expect that. Um, there's popular radio. Pop, couple of terrorist uh, looks you could probably fill in. <laughs> I can do terrorists. I can do terrorists very well. I don't think we... Yeah. Say, so, what's, so uh, is there any projects uh, that you can tell us about? What's what, what you got yourself into at the moment? I know you've done the, uh, the old documentary with, uh, with regards to your dad, but is there any... What's, what's yeah, up? so we're in the middle um, and we were pitched, asked to pitch to a certain global TV online T Sky company for seven episodes. This is how nervous it is. Wow. Um, and then they said, we want two seasons out of you for what you've written about the <clears throat> stories about the SAS. And we were like, right. And then they dropped the biggest bomb of all and said it was worth 100 grand an episode to me for the writer. <laughs> Wow. Uh, no deal. You, uh, you fancy sponsoring the Dodgers next season? <laughs> hey, I've stayed away from sevens. Trust me, I've stayed Not away from sevens. Not anymore. Yeah, yeah. Danny, you, you yeah, mentioned I look, I was going to say, before we get off the subject completely, what's the name of your charity and what, what is it for? Okay, so two years ago, um, I was in Europe with Luxembourg in, in the Bundesliga sites, and we were sat there working out how we could increase the number of 18 year old kids to play rugby and Luxembourg richest country and city in Europe awesome. had was struggling for struggling for numbers yeah because they have to play in the Belgian leagues or the German leagues so what we looked at was the fact of bringing some children over from Fiji and they all went let's get down to get some kids over and I thought well would this be cheating but what we did is we brought four young boys under 18s from the toughest slums in Fiji but as you can probably guess, they can play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they'd never been on. They'd never been on a plane. Even had passports, visas. Yeah, <clears throat> we got them on British Airways, and British Airways even let them sit in the cockpit at the end because the boys got really nervous as they saw a woman come out of a cabin who was the pilot. <laughs> um, and they arrived, and three days later, I sort of was like, we've got to give this a name, and. Fiji, Kenya and South Africa all play competitive rugby up to the age of 14 barefoot. Doesn't matter if you've got boots or not, you were, if you call it the barefoot project, it was not a charity. Yeah. <clears throat> it was all about raising boots. No money would cross to change hands or anything. It was about the boots and to give kids an equal playing field to play on. And uh, within two weeks of them arriving, we went and, it sounds like we went shopping here. We only got two boys from the Nairobi slum, the biggest slum in Kenya, yeah. and brought them over. And so we had two Kenyans and four Fijians and put them in the under 18s team to run around and play rugby in the German and Belgium leagues. And yeah. that's how Barefoot started. We had them over for three months, but they all went back with a second or well, third language, mm -hmm. as well as English, uh, French and German opposite. And they went back with education and two Kenyans ended up being qualified by world rugby for refereeing. So they at least have wow. a job when they get wow. back. Um, and that's what it did. And that's what it did. And that's how Barefoot started two years ago. Amazing. Yeah, definitely changed. Uh, so 
you're definitely changing some lives um, in those areas where, yes, predominantly playing rugby at a good standard. So Fijians very well known for their rugby, especially in the seven circuit. Yeah, but they don't. They, yeah, seven they're, circuit, they're but touch. They're, their yeah, touch is full contact. Exactly. It's exactly. So bringing them over, you've definitely opened their eyes into a whole new scenario, and given them not not just not just a new lease of life, but some new. But it was cool runnings, gents. Yeah. It was cool runnings. It was like cool runnings. <laughs> they arrived to lucky the egg. snow. <laughs> yeah. they, they, and oh, yeah. the, what was funny was we put a shout out to uh, members to come and clear the pitches, and Luxembourg's pitch is a 4G without the rubber crumb. Oh. So it's oh, mint. Nasty. It's mint. All right, so these boys come over. We can't play rugby. And you know what? Out of all the couple of kids from the club, typical, and all the Fijians and the Kenyans cleared the snow. They were jumping around in the snow. They'd never <laughs> seen snow before. So they were clearing it and laughing and giggling. But it was cool runnings. I mean, they could have put suitcases on and just sat in their suitcases. <laughs> uh, it, we have a photograph of them all like this going... Amazing. And, 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 and it was, it was life-changing, not just them, but for the people in Luxembourg and myself. Amazing. So obviously, uh, moving forward through um, your humble careers, you've been uh, involved in many different sports. The F word, we won't go anywhere near, but obviously basketball, rugby league and rugby union. Yeah, it's... Talk us how you, how you got into that from a young age, obviously. I know, uh, okay, so you, you, so you look stuff. at what's going on in the world now yeah and and the, the that level playing field there wasn't that i wasn't a state i was a state school boy mm -hmm. i was a, a high school decathlete as you can probably tell by my size the 1500 meters was not my event <laughs> i made sure i got the points on everything else but i wasn't great at rugby i wasn't from rugby stock and i played for worcester for many years played for various regional teams and invitational sides, similar to the Bar Bars, where all the best players from the Midlands played together. That included the likes of Mosley and Coventry back in those days. They were just Division One clubs. Um, and I was always giving it to that kid on the wing and let him run. But the thing is, very much like me now at Sevens, I was running sideways before I even ran forwards, looking for a spot. And oh, one stage, cool. the, the whole team just stood and watched me hand off, they say, jokingly, virtually everybody on the team before I even went forward. <laughs> on the opposition so we played played that I got very caught up in the issues of uh, the politics of rugby back in the 90s I just just didn't enjoy it it was full of public school boys at the time um, yeah. and so I went and started bouncing that ball around and suddenly you get a professional contract with the biggest club in the UK and you get signed by one of the biggest clubs and you're doing MTV you're doing uh, videos for pop groups, slam, dunk the funk, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and then you, you meet stars, and, and it was amazing. I even had blonde hair. So um, Now we need to go find a picture of that. Um, yeah, well, we won't take too much of it. And that was not because I saw Dennis Rodman. It's because I saw David James and Stan Collymore back in those oh. It was, it, yeah, but I looked like a pint of Guinness because the weather was bright. <laughs> but any ethnicity, of black, black ethnicity, would have their hair dyed. I was just mixed race. Of well, the original guy was, um, was it Wesley Snipes in Demolition Man, wasn't it? Oh, and trust it me, I had that. Hair, I had that. Yeah. And then people used to sing, the only way is up. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and my intro, intro song was, the only way is up. As I ran out onto the court and threw a couple of hundred people. And then I was called Yaz. What was that yeah. about? <clears throat> but no, so the basketball, was huge. I love the game. I mean, you play three or four thousand people, but there's um, a great story that the fact that we're um, on Sky Sports that night, and I'm not playing. So I, later, earlier on in that day, I decided to get a run out for Worcester Rugby Club again. I was, mm. You know, you're not surprised. And I got my knees dirty, didn't I? So I'm sat in shorts behind the bench, and someone just went, "You've been playing rugby today." I went, "No, I haven't." Yes, you have. Why are your knees dirty? And I just went. Got to wash my knees, and uh, it sort of was, became detrimental to the game of basketball that I was sneaking off and having a game of rugby because I couldn't miss it. Yeah, and then the yeah. league came in uh, is regional and travelled north, but I was always rooted in Worcester at the time, so it was always Danny a man of all seasons, and I just played anything really. <clears throat> With with your time at Worcester, um, we've got actually we've got Marcel Garvey coming on on Sunday. Um, yeah. Did you play with Marcel at your time there at all? No, he joined when all that cash started arriving. <laughs> but um, Marcel, 
I played against when I was with Doncaster and we went and played Gloucester at King's Own. And I'm on the wing opposite him. And I was like, okay, this is not going to end up. He'd been playing for England he, or whatever. And he was rapid. So I just had to, but the, the side of the pitch I was marking him on was yeah. the legendary shed side. Oh, the shed heads. Oh, so I, I, I introduced Dom to that the other week. Shed. Start so in January, was, took him to the shed and he wasn't impressed. God. It's oh, like the I, bloody shed I, podcast when they I remember, on I remember tackling him. I mean, this is nothing big, nothing special. Tackling him and looking up and getting abuse. <laughs> and it, and not, that was just for the rest. It's nothing else. It was. <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, there was abuse there going on, and it was just like, right, I've learned my lesson now. I'll go to the other wing. <laughs> and I went to the other wing, and I was up against James Bailey. <laughs> and I just thought, if I don't, if I catch him, I can't let him get away. So I ended up learning WWF moves with these youngsters. But no, Marcel, <clears throat> bit of wheels there, bit of wheels. They both had wheels back in those days. Yeah, yeah. With with um, sorry, you mentioned the shed. I, I, you might have guessed from my accent. I'm a Gloucester fan. Um, with the shed, I, I've I've asked this with a couple of guests recently, previously. Oh my god! Uh, with all the different stadiums going on about the shed. Yeah, but do you not I, think of hot fuzz when you listen to people from the shed? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> hot fuzz. Yeah. Simon Pegg was literally five miles. He was but like he lived five miles down the road from me. So, uh, so there, there's a quick one. If you're a Gloucestershire boy, yeah, right. What's the link between hot fuzz? And Still on the Wall. Uh, it was it was filmed in Still on the Wall. Oh, Old, it was, no, 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 it was based on Still on the Wall. Was it? Because Still on the Wall wanted they the, Simon Pegg wanted them to film it there with the the mini train tracks and yeah. all that sort of stuff, the model village, and yeah. they wanted it to film. And Still on the Wall councillors would not allow them to have it. Yeah. They opted for the Gypsy Festival instead. <laughs> right. And had all the roof lead and copper nicked that week. <laughs> so it was. <laughs> so if you think of Stone okay. the Wall, that's why they went and found another town and, yeah. and small suburb to look like uh, Hot Fuzz. Sorry, yeah. carry on. No, no, it's, right. it's just a question. Was the shed the place that you hated playing in front of as an away player the most? Or is there another stadium that you think, bloody hell, I'll, I'll be playing against them today? From from an, an under 19s, 21s view, we used to play Gloucester because Worcester and Gloucester, even though Gloucester were in the Premiership back in the 90s, mm. Worcester would be full of the boys, yeah. and you just hated playing at Gloucester because it would just go off. And I wasn't a fighter, and I get criticised so much for being that person. But right. I said, you know what? If it went off, I'm the one they're going to throw off the bitch. I wouldn't <laughs> be able to get away with it. Um, <laughs> so and I and I don't fight, but. You just didn't like being on that side of the field. Mm. You know, if you caught the ball on, from the 22 and you ran to the right mm -hmm. and you're facing towards the, the, the original club building, yeah. you just didn't want to slice it. You didn't, it was that 16th man. There was no referee issue and you just get abused. And it wasn't nasty abuse, it would be heckling. Yeah, uh, and then you know, the there's, nothing, was, there's nothing worse than the standard fans that don't know the rules of rugby and just... Dom, you've got some of the Gloucester, Gloucester, yeah, but it was like, knowledgeable it was like, Gloucester fans. <laughs> yeah, but it was like something like Jeremy Carl's Green Room. That's what the Shed <laughs> fans were like. I, mean, you could I, could count, I could count 22 teeth, and that was in the whole of the Shed. <laughs> wow. Love that. Yeah. I've had, I've I'll had give you a that. few experiences. That was enough. <laughs> but then so, when, so when I was being to Gloucester... Of Gloucester. Um, when I go to Gloucester, if, you need, if you need Danny uh, Lingari's uh, address, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know that guess who's the lead ambassador for Barefoot at the moment? Who's that? Ollie Thorley. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but he, he, he's he's amazing. But um, you've got he, a few um, top names following now, haven't you? You've got yeah, yeah. Well, it's not following. It's they're all helping as an ambassadors and they're part of it all, haven't you? Yeah. Um, that's a good one. There's some not so near. But Barefoot's about second chances and opportunities. Yeah. And um, Stefan had a problem last year, but he'd done amazing work. Stefan Armitage was mm. awesome. Yeah. Um, and I can't, I mean, he, fly, he flew to Kenya off his own back, um, got to see giraffes and elephants, went into Kamiti Maximum Security Prison. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. 
terrorists, murderers. Yeah. I was coaching rugby and took them boots for, for me, paid for everything for himself and then went off there. That's the difference. The difference of Barefoot's charity and everybody <clears throat> else's is that they don't, they, they don't, we, they don't get paid. They yeah. do, we find, Ollie Thorley's been amazing. Signed jerseys, raises money, yeah. does a video. Um, he's just been perfect. Yeah, that's, that's good. So, so get behind you like that, it could be really, you know, give you a kick at the, at the backside showing you, do, you know, doing the right thing. And if everyone else is, is working as hard as you, then it's, it's going to fly. I mean, like you said, it's been going two years already. So, you know, it's... 5,000 pairs of boots we've raised. Wow. Travelled over 100,000 miles. Uh, four sports, three countries, two continents, one opportunity. Nice. You've been practising that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I can see it on so, a shirt somewhere. <laughs> so following, um, obviously, follow on from rugby, uh, well, sport in general with yourself uh, and everything that you've been doing for the Barefoot in the last couple of years, obviously you've had something a little bit different happening to you recently. Uh, obviously your documentary, is it Find, Finding My Father? Finding my father, which is about me finding my, my real dad, who's also yeah. already got your colleague's name already. Now I've just texted <laughs> So obviously, Illisoni was a uh, former S SAS major. See, the senior, the, the first Fijian yeah. in the SAS. Wow. wow. Was, obviously, we're a big mental health charity. And oh, we, so we're not the charity, but we, we do we're an advocate of Marshall and Men's Minds down in Gloucester. Uh, yeah. Now, obviously, mental health is a big thing, and I can see there must have been some turmoil through that documentary with you. Uh, there must have been some very mixed emotions going on. Obviously, how I've got goosebumps now. Even you, yeah, just bring how, it up. how did you kind of combat? <clears throat> how did you get through that to get through the documentary and obviously get to the end game, which was meeting your father? How? What sort of things were you doing inside to kind of keep yourself level-headed and kind of the goal sort of thing? It's. I mean, it, if, if we go to into the Fijian culture. And, and you know that as players, uh, as rugby, that it's the cultural aspect and the tribal and the war aspect is in there. Mm -hmm. So I've played many time against the Gians and I'm being the British Army a few times, Jay knows all that sort of stuff. But you've got the ones who love you and you've got the ones who want to take a pop, a little pop at you mm -hmm. because of who you are. And when I arrived in Fiji, I arrived to TV cameras um, I arrived to welcoming families to so seven days in after seeing my dad to have it all turned on against me for jealousy. Uh, family deciding to have DNA tests, family demanding that we do that because there's islands, there's an airport, there's land, everything's involved. It was like coming to America, but reversed. Um, yeah. And as a rugby player as well, I was doing stuff on TV with Samurai Bai and Fiji Rugby Union, the president of Fiji, the prime minister, meeting them and talking about what I'd achieved with Barefoot, to just having that in the back of my head of my mind, sorry, that who my father was. Yeah. And I mean, the last year we filmed towards most of it and then we did some more this year. I mean, to find out your dad was the first Fijian to join the SAS. Yeah, it's amazing. To pass selection. Um, to run up Penny fan, which everybody talks about the band dance, to be one of the leading uh, DSs in the SAS, to work alongside the embassy siege as a senior officer, but he was on the front line. So I had all these things when I went to Fiji, and it was very overcoming. And Jay, it's, it, like you said, it's, it's all like you have to wind your neck in. Mm. As, and, and politics kept me out of Fiji rugby in 2002. And it was only because of my dad, because there was military coups and everything like that. Dad had bodyguarded Princess Di. He trained all the counter-terrorist teams in, wow. against, in Ireland. Okay. Trained the Germans, uh, the, the Israelis, the Kenyans, the South African special forces and the police, the Americans. Mm. But all that was on my shoulders when I arrived there. This year, when we did the final bits, it was just emotion. I didn't stop crying. I just didn't. And, and you just realise that your responsibilities as a senior person in a village that looks up to you. Um, mm -hmm. My nephew is one of the best rugby 
fifteens players in World Rugby, Fiji and Norman and Lingieri, who who cost Jonah his test place. The last time we saw Jonah play for All Blacks, he was played played against Norman. Although they won, Norman did him three times, which stood showed Jonah his his fault, sadly enough. Mm. But um you're you're expected and to be person and I just <clears throat> wanted um acceptance. You know, it's, it was like trials for a, a, a team. You could be the best person on the field, but you have to be accepted by the coaches and yeah. the people around you to, to, to get on in the side. Yeah. How did it feel like, far, A, first of all, finding, finding out your father, then, and then B, finding out, obviously, he's this obviously fantastic man who had, had accomplished masses and masses over, over his lifetime. You know, how did that... How does that feel? You know, how does that fit with you? It's... I don't know. Did you feel proud? I do. And, 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 and it's like on today, the days of the VE day and stuff. Like that. You have to think back exactly. of who, 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 what they did for the British forces. I mean, there were 212 Fijians. I mean, the series we're filming, it's between Netflix and Amazon at the moment, wants involvement. Um, and it will be based on all seven of those Fijians that joined the SAS. Yeah. Um, and Dad was the first. <clears throat> and each episode will be based on them. So we, the way that I've looked at celebrating and, and understanding it is actually filming it. But I've re- written and researched everything. There's even going to be a bit of rugby in the series as well. A bit of love. You know, they, uh, imagine, <laughs> them, imagine, imagine a bunch of Islanders with alcohol. You've all witnessed that. <laughs> Imagine that in the sixties, in brown suits, flared collars. I can never see had a suit before. Um, a bit I mean, like Dolomite is my name, but with rugby thrown in as well. And all it's, the it's, it, it, I mean, I, found, I heard one story about my dad, which really interests me. They play, they were playing rugby somewhere, and you're talking the seventies, right? And dad was playing, and what we saw, we, what we found out was, they were looking, they're all in kit. And dad stands there in his military trousers with tucked in his socks and his training shoes. And they're just like, what's Lingiri doing? What's Lingiri doing? And at the end of the, talk, the game, everyone else's knees are ripped to pieces. My dad stood there just going, winking. You know what I mean? Just winking. Because he played in his combat trousers. He didn't yeah. care. He knew about it. He was there. And so you've got to think back of, okay, what influences? My English father who adopted me, amazing businessman, amazing opportunity and then you got my Fijian dad I mean when I walked into the defense club with the prime minister and the president there I mean this is the governing government having a beer like in a working men's club mm-hmm. and they both went he's definitely Lingiri look at the way he walks but I'm three inches taller than my dad <laughs> so you, you've got all this expectation on your shoulders but <laughs> as Jay knows from coaching and playing that it's Sometimes you just you've actually just got to hold back a bit and and, and view and everybody else. With with these um, roles that you're writing, obviously, and, and the documentary you're doing about your, your father's career and, and, and meeting, did you ever did you ever consider going on the SES Who Dares Wins program to do a bit of research? Oh, that would be mental. Behind the right. line, um, well, I met Ant. Oh, okay, two years ago, and he was like, "Yes, brother." So I went, "I'm in a Sonny Lingiri son." He went. Oh, all right, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, so, you, can you imagine it, Ant, can you imagine Ant putting a bag on Danny's head, knowing who his dad was? And just, no, 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 no. Yeah. I know your family. Jay, a sack. It'll be a sack. Yeah, it's a sack. So yeah, yeah it's the woven no, sack. No, no, no. A proper sack. Because exactly. my head's so big. Yeah. <laughs> I just can't imagine it happen. Being sat down in a room, just going, I fucking know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the issue that I've got oh, shit. is that I get pulled up on stuff, and I'm not an expert in the SAS, but the research I've done and what I've heard about from a dad and the guys who did the embassy siege, the mirror bats, the, mm. the IRA stuff, all that, they don't shout at people like you see on the TV show. No. <laughs> no. If you follow what else people are saying, they're like, shouldn't ever shout at somebody, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And that's what's going on. Mm. Um, and so I watch it, and, I, and, I, and one story I heard was the guy was on selection and he was getting to the final uh, RV point and it's snowing and it's freezing on top of Penny Fan. And he's thinking, right, I don't need shouting out. As he turned there, this guy turned around, pulled his mask down. I went, 
keep going, son. And it was my father. He said, out of all of them, to have him say, go on, you're there, you're there, was yeah. the most motivational point to get there. And that guy was in the embassy siege. That guy was involved in other stuff. Um, Falklands. It's, it's amazing to find out. And that's probably totally opposite to me because Jay, Jay see me coach and play. I'm, I'm like the biggest joker on the rugby field. We could be losing, but I would still make a mock of three or four players <laughs> for, for a big guy throwing one-handed passes. But my dad would never be like that. My dad would do the job and do the job yeah. as, as efficiently as he could. Yeah. And, I'll, um, and with yourself, obviously, how, how long did you know who your father was and what he was? was it so, wild, um, as a kid? <laughs> 1988. Were you even born then? No, I was a year off. Uh, I was. I was four. I was. <laughs> I was born in '96. They don't have any. They old. don't have any birth certificates in Gloucester. They don't. It's it's written on the back <laughs> of a pig. It's written on the back of a pig and stamped by the mayor, who is also <laughs> the village idiot. Yeah. And runs the post office. <laughs> That's and right. He runs the post office. You got him. Any luck catching them killers then? So that's what he said. So no. So we looked at these things. So 1988, I found some documents documentation saying who my dad was and where he's from and how old he was, excuse me. So uh, we were looking for some documentation on who my dad was. And I found a piece of paper hidden in some drawers when you're not supposed to be going for your parents' drawers and it was hidden underneath. And what we did was we looked and it said, son of an SAS person. And it was like, this is why my English parents had sent me to watch uh, army shows, you know, when they do like the tattoos and tank shows and old World War II machine, all that sort of stuff. I didn't know. I'd even been to army cadets and led the embassy, uh, led my embassy, did the, the orienteering <clears throat> courses. Mm. And I was leading team. So I didn't know all this, but it sort of made sense. And it didn't say what nationality I was. Fast forward six, six, seven years, I'm on a speakerphone. And I don't know if, because you're not old enough, they used to have cardboard passports, which for one year you'd have. But you could yes, go to the post and get your post up. Yeah. Cardboard you know, passport. Yeah, Is that what you got for being from Germany? Is that no, what it's, no, 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 because it used to be around the times where, because even though I was a child, I used to be able to go on. <clears> and, and what, you'd have a cardboard passport, wouldn't you? With, so yeah. we had to check on my, I wanted to check on, because it was for basketball my uh, ethnicity and everything like that. So we're on speakerphone and I contact my biological mum. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in a, an office in Worcester doing sports development, sport as usual. Um, and I'm on there and she says, so, so, so hi, she says, hi. I said, I've got to apply for my, my 10 year passport. And I said, I need to know my dad's biological background. And she went, you're Fijian. And you could have seen everybody in the office is going, that's why he runs around with the ball in one hand. That's why, <laughs> That's why he doesn't listen to anybody. He's one of those guys that long socks and and it, and it made sense. And, and that's how we found out. And then 2000, I'd played rugby for Quinns and we were doing the Middlesex Sevens and I knew I was for gym. So suddenly all these soldiers kept coming up to me going, we know who you are. We know, because you. you know, they all go and watch the Middlesex Sevens. This is when yeah, it was yeah. huge. I'm talking 30,000 people, car parks full, Not Samurai with the lo Samurai with the worst team. <laughs> then mm -hmm. you had Fred Josh Lucy playing, Castagnier, all that lot playing. And I'm sat there and these guys going, good try, good try. And I'm just like, I didn't understand that. And then this little guy comes up to me, sleeves rolled up, socks rolled up, tight tape on, big, huge grin and said, good try, brother. And I was like, right, Sarevi. I'd never met him before. <laughs> Sarevi. Wow. Then you meet Satala. Then you meet Taniela Galga, some of the greatest. Some of the... Then Eric Rush. And then you realize you're chatting to the Penguins team that used to destroy everybody. At... And then we come out of the stadium at Quinn's and it had gone like wildfire around Middlesex Sevens because you used to ask why so many British army soldiers used to be the stewards at the Middlesex Sevens, because they were all Fijians, because they were like that. Stop watching the game. <laughs> they all get yeah. the game their shoulder. And, and, and that's how it sort of uh, came to fruition over the Fijian side and who my dad was. 
did you obviously when when you found out who it was obviously i come from a big uh, army background my both my parents my grandfather and uncles the lot so obviously with me there was a lot of expectation of especially from a mental health point of view which is well uh, circle it of grin and bear it pick yourself up dust yourself off up stiff off a belief on all that bullshit that came with being in a, an army brat so to speak is that the kind of mentality that um you, you see out of obviously in the setup so i know fijian culture is a big difference yeah, but you remember i came i was i was brought up as a british yeah boy. i mean when you went out there obviously you said it, no, it's it's, it's it something that I'm, I'm not great with. It's that humble thing because when you live your life doing sport, charities, TV and social media, you're not humble, are you? Yeah. <laughs> so so it, it's totally the opposite with my father. But it's, it's, it's quite emotional to deal with it all with my dad yeah. and, and understand. I mean, when we went out this year with my son, we took my son out on a secret mission who, my son's amazing at rugby, just doesn't want to play. Met the wrong coaches, quit. He has, he, he's got feet like William Ryder, and he doesn't want to play. He's 23 years old. Wanna, not, does he want to play not, for the Dodgers? Yeah, get him not, No, no, he, he, the reason why, he, I'm waiting to be a granddad. But that's, oh, wow. he's a, it's about to drop anytime, even now. Oh, um, right, okay. He, 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 he is amazing, talented young kid. Um, He's having a, about to have his first child, the same sort of age I was when I had him. But I was playing professional sports, so I had security. But we took him out to Fiji, <clears throat> and we told nobody. I didn't even tell anybody we were going. Mm. And when we got there, and we, we arrived in Dad's village, and we walked into the village, we got a bit of film bits of it. My dad didn't even know we were coming. And you've got to see, there's this legend of this SAS hero sat on the stairs watching just the country and he looks and he sees this tall blonde kid and he just think i think he just thought it was a visitor to the village mm. and i popped my head round, and he didn't think he was ever going to see me again after the first meeting and i went buller and he was like oh, and his eyes lit up this is a guy who's 82. Mm. he got off the mm -hmm. floor quicker uh, quicker than any 20 year old honestly got up and i said this is reese your grandson so you saw this this 82 year old stand up, beautiful smile, cuddling, kissing my face, smelling me, grabbing my my little brother, my English brother, smelling his face, kissing him, coming, and then looking at Reese, but looking up, <laughs> and guy breaks down in tears. Imagine what that, like, there's a difference. There's a difference in emotions. It takes some um, sort of person not to, though, wouldn't it? In that situation, I mean, he didn't know. He did not know we were there. Yeah, we yeah. didn't. The year before, TV interviews, radio, press, everything about me being there. It was a bit, un un he didn't like it, didn't, un it was a bit unnerving for him. Yeah. So we did all that. Um, and then my son dropped the other bomb on him. You're going to be a great granddad. You're going to have another, a great grandson, an official wow. bloodline. Wow. So amazing. it was, it was just amazing. And, and that was the perfect tribute to getting the finding my father thing just put together, ready before we do every, all the other filming. Yeah. Um, but when he shook your hand, Jay, his hands are bigger than mine. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to mess with them? Even no. <laughs> yeah, but even, 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 even my... Even, even the fact Danny's got hands like shovels. Big, biggest, <laughs> probably biggest hand off and the biggest ones around. Yeah, but um, what I'm saying is that he shook my hand and I was like, oh my God. And he's still firm grip and bigger. <laughs> He shook my son's hand. My son's got massive hands as well. And, but my little brother shook his hand and went, oh my God, how many, how, how many people has he killed with them? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, we all stood back and went, ooh. But he, he wanted to come for a walk through the, the... So you when you see Moana, have you ever seen Moana? Have you yes. watched it? You yeah, know when they I've walk through the village that. and everybody's got a job? Mm. That's what they yeah. talk about. Yeah, yeah. This was like <clears> my dad. People are there carving, people are there doing trees and vegetables. He mm. wanted to come with us. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're 82. <laughs> Sit down. And, <laughs> and, and, and that was it. But he's still active, still works with the kids playing rugby, still helps raise children there, uh, helps the village. We've got the largest village in Fiji, one of those islands, 87 houses, airstrip. <laughs> everything but no it's 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 something when you look at 
because he 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 always put his family in his job first, and rugby came third or fourth, basically. Yeah. yeah. Danny, you, you obviously you've um, you played a lot of sport, uh, but I want to just switch over to your acting career uh, briefly. Yeah. Obviously, we've all seen you in um, uh, Taboo. Uh, I'm sure you did a lot of other things as well. How did you originally get into it? Was it something you always wanted <clears> to do? Or uh, it's a, you got no. lucky. So he, he can, you can... Hey, 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 what's your name, Danny? I'm asking the man lucky. himself. Not no, no, he got lucky. No, no, no. <laughs> Jay, Jay knows. I'm coaching rugby, as usual, at Richmond's Old Deer Park. Mm -hmm. And this dog runs across the middle of my rugby session. Yeah. And these, this is Richmond I'm in charge of. My kids are undefeated. I mean, Callum Circus, people like that have gone on to play England Seven. Uh, all the kids from the private schools and state schools got a bit. And they're all stood looking at me like, and I'm like, what's wrong? And they're like, it's Tom Hardy. I went, what, the England back rower? And typical kid, <laughs> stop being a dick. That's Tom Croft. And I was like, no idea. But this dog... <laughs> This dog was licking my face and I'm pet petting the dog. And I turn around and the boys are like, it's Tom Hardy. And Tom Hardy turned around and said, dogs know good people. And they did actually do, do you know what I mean? They warmed to people. And then we, it was two days or three days before Rugby Rocks. Uh, so it was, that, it was getting to be warm that weekend. It was a couple of days after Bournemouth, which murdered me. Well, there's everyone that was. I was going to say, yeah. It's yeah, so I've got a lot. Of, Jane has loads of stories about Bournemouth, but um, no, it's and, and that's what happened then 2016, having a tough time, separation again, and because of sport. And I thought somebody's pulling my leg, so I kept putting the phone down, just like you see in the films. Yeah, whatever. Next, somebody else, phone yeah, 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 and then they're texting it's in Instagram, and then you find out they're for real, it's Ridley Scott Studios. Bloody hell. Wow. And then you're like, but if we got understand his fate, earlier that day I'd had a, a, a huge row with a close family friend about mm. I should be living on the past of this, 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 this to then going to London mm. and seeing my own dressing room wow. with my name on. And I've got a runner outside who brought me wine gums and Red Bull <laughs> already. That was in my that was in my trailer every week. In your Every rider. Day. Was it just yeah. blue M&M's? No, oh, yeah. M&M's. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't go for that stuff because I'm too much wine, sugar. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Wine, wine gums and jelly babies smashed it out. Um, and then that happened. And uh, some of the greatest things, I met Tom Holland, who was in uh, The Night Manager. Uh, the small guy, not Tom Hollander. Tom Holland. Uh, he's in quite a few films. Little naughty man. He was he's amazing. Yes, no, that's Tom Holland. Uh, yeah. No, Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Holland. Tom Holland. There's two of them, Holland. isn't there? There's the young yeah. kid, oh, okay. and then there's the older guy. Right. right. Come on, Neil. So I've got Jonathan Price, Tom Hardy, Stephen Graham. Uh, I'm like, I just stood around. And then the, the best moment is, Jay knows I love my tunes as well. So I've got some music playing on in my trailer <laughs> on set. Mm. And a pill. And I, I'm like, what's going on? And this then this big young kid who's on set sat talking to me and he came and chilled out and chatted to me and I gave him some wine gums and stuff like that and and then knock at the door he comes on the on the bus on my on my trail on my trailer right comes sits down he goes oh this is my dad and he comes in Andy Circus bloody hell <laughs> Gollum I'm like that. Okay. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, and people were saying, so how long have you been in this acting business? Amazing tattoos, amazing hair. And they found out that I designed all that stuff. Um, and they were just like, great, how long have you been in? And I'm like, two weeks. And your main cast? Oh my word. And it was, there was like people there been studying being actors 20, 30 years and I'm on main cast credited. And it was an amazing experience. I mean, we had lines. We scrapped them because I turned around and said, well, hang on, there's, you've just colonised Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. Nobody's going to have an accent. You're not going to speak like a Kiwi or a Maori, am I? Yeah, so I just said, yeah. to, to make it easier, I just said I'll be a Polynesian Wookiee and just say nothing. <laughs> um, and, and that was it. And it, it just went on from there. We finished filming. Uh, six months, even coincided with Bournemouth. It was awesome. Um, and Manila Thames and Hong Kong. What else did it coincide? So you can imagine me milking it when I got to those events. Obviously. 
You might Obviously. as well. So no, and and it, and it was that, and then we had offers of loads of other films from then. Mm, amazing. Well, as I say, I, I, I did drama and theatre studies at school. Uh, always up, Neil. It's not going to happen. I'll send you my uh, headshots. It's not going to happen, Neil. No. no, yeah, but remember who my dad is. That's the only headshot you're going to get. Yeah, hey. <laughs> oh. well, the thing is, well. I'm, I'm in Erreford as well, so it's not far away from, from where I used to train. So, where are you? So are you gonna, you, you're not going out tonight to the pub, are you? Not to the pub, no. <laughs> can't go to right, we've got can't town on the buzz because the buzz ain't running. <laughs> There's no trains to Worcester now either. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> so, no, um, the, the TV stuff's been amazing. So, experience. So, we had inundated with links for sport coaching and national team's jobs mm -hmm. to equalizer two to play a nasty bad man in that i think they start to stereotype me um <laughs> game, game of thrones nice. game, game of thrones yeah. and it was not it's this is casted position as a main actor um probably gonna, clearly gonna be a dothraki wasn't i nothing else um uh, the kursk i'd already signed for two movies in america but didn't turn diva, but it was just like, they were taking too long to agreements and they give me all the credits on IMDb. But I mean, it was amazing. And then <clears> the <throat> biggest of all was 2018, where I, I don't know if I mentioned that you get a phone call to say, can you be in London tomorrow? They like you and they're like, what for? They want you to be in Bond 25 as the new henchman. Wow. So I had to go to London yeah. and he said, there's a twist to this as well. I said, what? You've also got, and you've been shortlisted for this, to play The Rock's brother in Hobbs and Shaw. No. Nice. So I made sure I was hench, massive, masseuse. Um, did to London, hench, moved on Hench is cars. such an underrated word, isn't it? What? Hench. 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 It's a bloody brilliant Shut up, word, Dom. that. Oh, <laughs> no, but I was I'm called Mr. Hench. Podcast, mate. Called Mr. Hench. mate. Called Mr. Hench at school. <laughs> I was called Mr. Hench at school no by my kids. They, they'd come to the PE office and say, sir. And all the other PE teachers would look around and they went, nah, Hench, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so the, the Hobbs and Shaw and I lost out to Roman Reigns. Yeah. Um, and Bond, as you know, Danny Ball stepped down. So they changed the scripts and storylines and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's been amazing. So we just focused on the documentaries since then and the two films that were, were in the middle of writing off for the TV series. Mm. Yeah. I just want to get back to um, a bit of a situation I've been posting to a lot of our guests recently. Um, as a result, these guys call me uh, Scenario Neil. It's not a name I uh, like or... It's better than Tatum O'Neill. Well, there's, it's better than what, sorry? Tatum O'Neill. Well, that's Female. true. Yeah. Um, true. Right, well, I've got a bit of a scenario. So it's a lockdown and rugby-based question. Right, so yeah. you're, you're on lockdown in two weeks. Uh, for two weeks, sorry in oh, a flat, right with someone and it has to be someone you either played with or played against in your career yeah. right now out of everyone you played with or against who <clears> would <throat> make it an absolute living hell who could you not survive two weeks with and why have you have you ever met islanders <laughs> <laughs> of, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all so, scared um, <laughs> if you i think another polynesian the same size as me yeah, I, I think that'd be a living hell. It must be. <laughs> I mean, my brother has to shop in Gloucester to get food for me because everything, <laughs> they, nobody will have food. I mean, he comes back, with, but no, um, a living hell. Um, not many players scare me, but uh, some stories of people like Epi Tyone used to play for Quinns, um, Tonga, the guy who dyed his hair green for the World Cup. Remember when they all dyed their hair green in 2007? I think you were all ten then playing mini, mini rugby, weren't you? No, no, I was. I was drinking age, I, I, and you I, had hair. I still only drink. Yeah, I had hair. I could still only drink two pints then, though. But. So the Tonga had a, a, a player called Epi Tyrone, a player of Tyrone, who's a very good mate of mine since <coughs> early two thousands, and he dyes his hair. He's the sort of guy if he drinks, he punches you. You know that person. <laughs> you know every sort of that person. Yeah, Epi's probably bigger than me. Bloody hell. Um, and he played eight on the wing, Natal Sharks, uh, played Newcastle Falcons for many years, mm. um, played in France. He's, I mean, the joke is, they always say, if there was a Holocaust and there was a nuclear whatever, Epi's skull 
would still be the only thing that survives because it's massive. <laughs> and a cockroach <laughs> running over the top of it. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. the cockroach would be that small. But but no, Epi would be the one that I would probably be too scared to live with because he's bigger than me. He drinks. I mean, he's yeah. he's had a few problems lately, but going back on memories, he'd be the worst probably to live with. No, fair enough. Good awesome. Answer. Well, and I'll take him. Sorry, him. He is dangerous. <laughs> well, Danny, it's been well, yeah. a privilege having you on. Uh, nearly ten, it'll be nearly ten years coming up soon. Well, that we met. Yeah, it's been a long while. <coughs> yeah, but well, you, you were always Mr. For that, Danny. You were no, but he was always again not blow his trumpet. He reliable. Thought he was Polynesian. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but 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 no, gents. I threw some great good, passes. Good, good player, always around me. You always wore, wore the wrong size shorts, didn't you? Yes. They just you don't make you nice legs. legs. You've only got got nice, legs. I have got nice legs, and there's no got... reason why I shouldn't show them. No, so can I ask you three guys? So we're talking about kit quickly. What are your thoughts on Umbro? I, oh, I was I'm not that. as outraged as everyone else, to be honest. I'm, I'm not that outraged. If it's a nice kit and it's good quality, like surprising. I think. Um, I don't, I don't like the association with football, but at this current state, you can't be turning money down like that as a union. Is true. The the true. Well, the year, do you know that Umbro was owned by Nike in 2012? They sold it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then they did like the 1970s Lions kit and stuff like that. So they've got a bit of heritage, but it's yeah, I mean, I'd heard, I'd heard about it for a few months and I, I sort of yeah, didn't so want to believe it. Yeah, so last year it was announced then, last year that they could be going yeah, yeah, to Umbro. Yeah, you know, yeah. The deal was on the table. If we don't get the autumn internationals this year, it could be financially scuppered for the RFU. So you've got to take whatever you can get five million a year, mm. take it. So, as, as so current, I at this current stage. So I mean, so I'm reversing <coughs> this, this this podcast now. Oh, I can tell, gentlemen. I mean, who, who's Bill Beaumont, who's there? Bill Beaumont, Augustus Pichot. Which oh. this he, is going to separate the like, men from the boys. Now, right, these two... I've got a lot of inside yeah, information, so you need to get rugby. it right. I know, I know very little about, about rugby. I know a lot about rugby. <laughs> I've it all my life. But in terms of, like, players, you know, who should... Do, do, do. I've always liked Bill Beaumont. He's, he's doing a very thankless task. <clears> but you do need some youth in there to stay true to, you know, rugby nowadays. It's, it's, if you just stay with the old heads, then you're never going to evolve the sport. With me, I think, um, see, with me, yeah. Bill Bo- what Bill Bowman's plans are, uh, and especially for the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, you've been researching, have you? Oh, oh I, of course. Mate. I, I, oh, I, I, I'm always in the know <laughs> with the rugby stuff. I always keep up to date. The stuff he's looking at with the Southern Hemisphere and rename for the likes of renaming Tier One and Tier Two nations to emerging, and I can't remember the other ones, but actually renaming it so it doesn't look like One and Two and Best and Little. Or yeah. Best. Adding Japan into uh, into the in the top tier nation, <coughs> and putting them in there, Fiji into the top tier nations. He's he, he's got so many plans to kind of instead of having it segregated, which obviously I had the chance of training with a tier two nation at the time. Yeah, so was with you when I was with Germany, and the difference, the stark differences. Yes, the way they trained, <coughs> they had their camp. I was there for camp for a week, and the way they trained was because uh, I've actually still got the message. You telling me. Yes, because uh, I was playing with one of your J9 guys. Uh, or I was training with one of your J9 guys. Yeah, Luke. Which I don't think these guys know, which was the time I got a chance to uh, train with Stade Francais. So I'll, I will... Uh... <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. You've got to pin that. You've got to pin that. You've got to pin that on exactly. your face. Pin it. <laughs> exactly. So seeing, um, seeing what he had to offer and where they were... Um, <clears throat> Got down a tier because the funding into those emerging nations wasn't there and it needs to be. I think Bill Bowman and the way he's doing things is going to start boosting up these uh, these second. If you massively, if you, I mean, what you don't know is that I, I didn't know about the 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 voting, but I was already with all the Fijian block saying, well, they're going to go with Bill Bowman. They're going to go. Because you've got to think of, between you three guys, you've got to think of how many Fijians play in France. Yeah, well, that's... that's okay, the thing, and the biggest thing I've written about at the moment is, you go to New Zealand or Australia that have been cherry-picking the Polynesian countries for years, mm-hmm. yeah? When they run out of money, they return home. They don't have any money left, right? 
But when they go back from France, the currency's stronger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The kids are returning with a third language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of these Polynesians, most majority of Fijians, are staying in France and living here in Europe. So they give their kids better opportunities in life. So yes. you've got to look at the money invested in the Fijians and the, the new Schengen visa rules. That was why they voted for Bill Beaumont. Yeah, and there's another thing that he's going to do. Uh, I think, that obviously, I was reading it today, was about these um, islanders who are playing for other nations, like the, the two Alagis, the Fulham, <clears throat> yeah, etc. When they're coming to the end of their careers and their test career, giving them the opportunity to go play for Tottenham. Yeah, which has been, for years, Jerry Collins uh, wanted to champion it, and I agreed. And Bill Bowman wants you to don't do that, pick, yeah. If you don't play for your tier one nation after two, three years, you can, you go. can go back to your home nation. Correct. So who's the well, German one who should have gone back to play for Germany? What, from England? Yeah. Toby Flood. There you are. So... He was already... The, there was already the, yeah, there was, there was things, because I think Mike Ford... Wanted. Because if, if you think of all the, the players that go to New Zealand, and then they don't get picked. Well, we, yeah, spoke, we, we, had, uh, we had Tim Nano williams on last night. And, again, heavy New Zealand links, and then played New Zealand age grade, and then when he went on to the international team, went to Samoa. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, league, it's, right it's, it's the only way to give an equal level, or level playing field. I mean, look, I was with Tonga Rugby League, wasn't I, for the World Cup. Um, they all left New Zealand to play, and Australia to play for Tonga. And yeah. look what a powerhouse they are mm -hmm. in league. But um, I mean, what I was, I was saying is that I, yeah. it, it was all, it's not about a money thing for these countries, it was all about the opportunities of R representing their own countries again yeah. as one as a big I mean <coughs> Samoa Fiji, Samoa and Tonga need Fiji in the because yeah, Fiji's brand I mean if you talk sevens you talk Fiji don't you you talk oh, Olympic so. yeah. rugby, oh, you talk so. Fiji you, you can't and every kid can play the same as what you see on the telly so when this voting thing came around we were watching it, not just for seeing what the vote was mm. but for bare foot as well because we do a lot of grassroots stuff and to mm. see the opportunities Com combined with what this this new opportunity is coming around, we could be do so much more for kids in France and in England. So no, that's why I asked you three. What are your thoughts? Because I, uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was, I was, I was, uh, I was all I was all in favour of a bit of a change in the guard. Really, is it change um, or correction? That's what, that's there's a difference. Well, that's the thing, you know. I think I think rugby has had a bit of a habit from grassroots level and especially from where I sit in the UK from grassroots level of being run by the old boys in blazers type thing mm -hmm. I said that once and they suspended me you know, <laughs> correct, you know correct well, me if I'm wrong but I think um, <laughs> I think rugby as a product especially in the UK you know we, the, amount of, the amount of money some players are getting paid isn't warranted by the actual the value of the product so you've got like some of the Saris boys, the Toje on 750, 150k. You know, no one's making that money back in, in the Premiership to warrant one player's salary. Um, so very yeah, right, I mean, very right. You know, I was all for a bit of change of the guard, but again, uh, you know, I don't think Bill I mean, Brown you've got to you've got to look at I know Augusta Pichot would playing mm -hmm. in in Richmond. He's got a lot of friends in Bristol. Yeah, there's no just mm -hmm. I I always always agree with things. But then you had to look on the on the present and the future prospects of what the Polynesian countries get, which is what swung the vote. New Zealand and South Africa got no votes from the Fijians. Mm -hmm. They swung it all yeah, the way to the other side. And, you know, you read into all these reports of, you know, short-term promises from, from New Zealand and Japan and stuff. And, you know, Japan, don't get me wrong, Japan had a great World Cup. But, yeah, but you take out, you take out all the islanders, then... What? Realistic, yeah, realistically... <laughs> Yeah, but realistically, at this moment in time, are they a tier one nation? Well, I'll give you think all for you, all three of you to think this thing now. Japan, Fiji, <clears throat> new organization of the Six Nations to be like the championship in 2021. There's something to think about, isn't there? Because yeah. you know South Africa will already apply, don't they? They're going to, they're on about shifting the tiers around. Mm -hmm. for a Six Nations to be similar to what the Championship is because there's yeah, no financial to, gain. Yeah, then you'd have to kind of tie in 
the both domestic seasons together. Yeah, know? so that that that's to tie in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere with the which domestic. is what a yeah. lot of people have wanted anyway. So they yeah, could... it's t- that's it's, it's going to be a tough ask. Yeah, who, I know. Who, who, but, who changes? Did the southern game hemisphere is in, change or did we change? The game is in reset. You yeah, know yourself. we're in a reset mode at the moment. But what I'm saying is that's what was. It'd be tough for us. It'd be tougher for us to change because obviously in, in oh, I don't think we'll change. I think we'll they'll change. change. Yeah, no, but for oh, us yeah, for sure. scheduling, we've got the rugby league and the rugby union where league kicks in at the at, towards the end of the rugby union season and people go and watch the league se- season or play sevens. Mm. And it's it's got it's I, I think it's gonna be tough for the Northern Hemisphere to change. Okay. Yeah, uh, right. But no, like like I said, then I think um it's a, it's a great topic to bring up, and I'd like to maybe get get you on a live. And you. I, I'd be very you know I'd be interested to hear what other people from the online world have to think. We'll invite a few journalists on. Yeah, we're going we'll to do you a, yeah, a live. And we'll have, a, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll have a bit of debate on a live feed. I think I think it'll be a, a, a healthy conversation to hear different I mean, people's aspects. It's, it's been it's been great to hear your views as well because it's been I've been writing about it all this week and. <laughs> because it affects Fiji massively. Mm-hmm. And yeah. to see what the Fijians have wanted, mm-hmm. and you're talking a one o'clock in the morning phone call or nine o'clock to listen to them, and it was all based around the voting. And they weren't going, we need Bill Bum, we need something that's going to create a level playing field. And Bill yeah. Beaumont's initial plans with France and the Northern Hemisphere sides was, I mean, you just, I know you've got to go, but you work out, England played Fiji less times than Ireland, Wales and Scotland and France. Mm. So their investment is in those countries. They go to Scotland, it's sold out. They go to <clears> France, <throat> it's sold out. Yeah. yeah. You go to Ireland, it's sold out. Wales, they might as well have been living there. Mm. The Welsh and the Fijians love each other. Mm. So yeah. it's, it's a big thing. Um, it's, it's, it affects barefoot. Um, and then you try to make your own non-political comment. And it can be yeah. taken out of context, but and, well, yeah, it's not only that. It, 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 at the end of the day, the way the way the sport is going, it all falls down to money. Yeah, uh, you know why? You know the autumn internationals, I believe, are picked. Three out of four of them are picked on financials. And oh, then, we were we were there for the Fiji, England game, two thousand and sixteen. It may have been, <clears throat> and it was the first thing that came to light about how much they were getting paid. Well, yeah, it was the, it was and like Campe- the and, and, it was like the eighty twenty split or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and Campesi Mafu snapped his forearm. Yeah, yeah. And I saw him quickly come out the back, and I went, "That's a big damage to you because for just three hundred and fifty quid, because that's all they were getting paid for to play exactly. against England." Yeah. And the politics comes into it, <clears> but it left him out of his job, his his club that he was playing mm. for. So no, yeah, it's 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 something to think about. I mean, yeah, it's, it's it affects it affects the charity, it affects individuals in the game, yeah. and it affects all of us who love it. Yeah, and it's definitely something uh, we'll 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 likely get you back on, and we'll we'll go off. Oh, and, you need, yeah, I'm to uh, call it a day on that one because yeah, uh, sorry, but, I mean it's, it's no, 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 just no, 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 but um, no, there's, there's, I think you do an amazing job. I loved it. I, will, I loved the, the abuse you gave Alex because <laughs> when, when you watch him, he just looks like he's looking at uh, Haskell like a, just a naughty child. Just like, uh, that's what he does, I think. <laughs> it should be called James Tangent Haskell because he just goes off from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But I enjoy it. It's, it's good. And, and you, well done to you guys for uh, putting this together because, I mean, I've got some ideas for barefoot to use you three for barefoot to do commentary and one pair of shoes makes a difference to a child exactly. so get you guys doing some stuff and mental health i'm always prepared to help yeah perfect well uh, yeah like i say danny thank you very much for coming on fantastic stories <laughs> your positivity your, steak, your positivity is infectious it's i'm going down to, to gloucester now to have have a chat with my boy there. Going to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, down, no, you can't. You can't ever go to or up to Gloucester. It's you go going downtown or going down Gloucester. Uh, well, I'm going to Cheltenham, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cheltenham's oh, got a completely different language. Yeah, Where exactly. are you going? Where is she? Uh, I mean, uh, one... an absolute Bravo. pleasure, mate. Sorry, oh, yeah, as always. Sorry, James. Great to speak to you. And all That's all right. Right. Cheers, Danny. Always a pleasure. And Thank we'll, you uh, very much, Danny. Soon, and, uh, yeah. <laughs>